Hello, I'm Kevin Bradley, and I'm here to discuss how to minimize and hopefully prevent the off-target movement of herbicides. In response to the increase of herbicide resistance in weeds, several agricultural seed and chemical companies have introduced new varieties of soybean and cotton that are tolerant to the synthetic auxin herbicides 2,4-D and dicamba. Dow AgroSciences and List Trait confers tolerance to 2,4-D in corn, cotton, and soybean, while Monsanto's Roundup Ready Extend trait confers tolerance to dicamba in cotton and soybean. Both traits might be commercially available to farmers as soon as the 2016 growing season. The USDA has approved these traits for use in the U.S., and it is believed that China will soon follow suit. Once these traits are commercially available, agricultural spray applications of 2,4-D and dicamba are likely to increase. And with this increase comes a greater possibility of off-target movement of these herbicides. There are numerous ornamental, vegetable, and crop species, such as roses, grapes, tomatoes, soybean, and cotton, that are especially sensitive to even low doses of 2,4-D and dicamba. Therefore, applicators will need to be even more vigilant in the future to ensure that off-target movement of these herbicides does not occur. The purpose of this video is to explain the ways in which a synthetic auxin herbicide like 2,4-D or dicamba might move off target and cause unintended damage to nearby vegetation, and also to provide applicators with some tips and tools that can keep this from occurring. So there are essentially three predominant factors that can affect the off target movement of herbicide. One being physical drift, which is when the herbicide is sprayed in windy conditions. The particles can be caught up and moved off site by the wind. The second would be volatilization of the herbicide. Some herbicides tend to vaporize more readily than others, so herbicide on a leaf surface could vaporize, become gas in the air where it could be moved. And third would be tank contamination, where the spray tank has been either insufficiently or incorrectly cleaned following herbicide application. So one of the things you want to look for when you're trying to diagnose what kind of injury it might have been that contacted your soybeans is uh, the presence of cupping here for one thing and that is when you look at these trifoliates all in the upper uh, tops of the plants and you see all these trifoliates that are very distinctively cupped there's some leaf malformation and distortion in some of them that it might not be an exact cup, but it's kind of a, a modeling appearance and all of that. Well, it's a pretty, pretty safe bet that this is a growth regulator herbicide, first and foremost. These are telltale symptoms of dicamba injury on soybeans that are not tolerant to dicamba. It takes only very, very small amounts of dicamba to uh, injure soybeans that are not uh, uh, tolerant and have not been modified with this trait. The presence of the uninjured trifoliates on the lower uh, parts of the plant indicate kind of when the application occurred and it gives you a way to diagnose what could have happened. And so in this case these soybeans were injured five or six weeks ago the spray was made and every new trifoliate that has come out since then has this cupping and this uh, injury associated with it. So it, it does kind of tell on you uh, what could have happened there. If, if this had been uh, real early in the season or maybe if it was even uptake from the soil, every single trifoliate all the way up through that plant would be injured, but that's not the case here. You see all these down through here are perfectly fine and that's because the herbicide was not sprayed in, at that time. So what we're able to see here in this a few rows of soybean is the symptoms that you might expect if off-target movement has occurred with 2,4-D. And as you can see right away, it's very different than dicamba. Uh, you'll notice that we don't have any cupping like we talked about with the dicamba soybeans. There's this twisting, uh, which we call epinasty, of the soybean plant itself, a lot of turn, stems and petioles and even leaves and pods if the rate was high enough. Uh, and uh, all of that leads to this overall epinastic effect that we uh, 
we attribute mostly to 2,4-D. Um, and so uh, another thing to look for that's really not showing up a whole lot here in this particular scenario is what we call leaf strapping. And uh, just pull that petiole and that trifoliate off and there's maybe some of it starting to show here, but you can get some malformed, some, some mottled leaves, uh, which you're seeing a little bit of here. But then the leaves will really start to take on odd shapes and really kind of pull, have kind of a drawstring effect on them. And uh, like I said, it's not occurring too much here in this particular plot, but we can see that from time to time as well. So that's one of the main things you want to look for for 2,4-D. Much different than dicamba. The dicamba is almost always going to show that cupping. With regards to physical drift, most herbicides are not supposed to be sprayed at wind speeds of 10 miles per hour or greater. And so we were able to look at the average hourly wind speeds each month of the growing season over 14 years at five locations in the state of Missouri. What we found was that in the month of April, wind speeds at all five locations during the midday were above nine miles per hour. So from about 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. in most locations, you get close to that 10 mile per hour wind speed cutoff. And this continued at a subset of those locations into May. And this is important because April and May are gonna be those times when growers are wanting to spray burn down applications, getting ready and getting eager to get in the field and plant. So if the applicator is gonna spray at those times, you really need to be cognizant of the wind speed of the direction of the wind and what's downstream. You know, are there grapes or tomatoes or other types of soybeans that are going to be highly sensitive to any drift that may occur during that time? Example we see here today, we see all these soybeans blowing and, and you can probably hear the, the wind out here. This is an example of a day where it would not be a good idea at all to be spraying 2,4-D or dicamba due to the risk of off-target movement to uh, neighbors feel down the way. The second way a herbicide, particularly a synthetic auxin herbicide, might move off site is through volatilization. Volatilization of a pesticide occurs when a liquid spray escapes off the intended crop as a vapor. And that can be a little tricky to detect because volatility is a property of the herbicide itself. But what we can look for are weather factors that impact or influence volatilization or vaporization of the herbicide. And one of the big weather factors that affects volatility are temperature inversions. So when a temperature inversion is occurring, you'll notice uh, less than three mile per hour wind speeds, little to no wind speed. You'll also usually see dew or fog present. Temperature inversions tend to be associated with relatively high humidity. Okay, so during a temperature inversion, the sun has set, um, the earth is being cooled now, it's no longer receiving that radiation from the sun. And then on a clear night, any radiation the earth is giving off is escaping into the atmosphere because there's no clouds to trap that heat in. And if you spray during these conditions, what you'll find is that the small particles, the small herbicide particles, may be suspended in the non-moving air, whereas the larger herbicide particles may actually make it to your target leaf. However, in the high humidity and low dew point, um, not be absorbed as quickly. And when the sun rises, those uh, particles can vaporize or volatilize from the leaf surface and be suspended in the air so that as the day goes on and the wind begins to pick up, they can be moved off site. So again, what you're looking for with a temperature inversion would be following a clear night, um, wind speeds of less than three miles per hour, as well as fog and dew are good indicators of that. Those are the mornings when you do not want to spray because there is likely a temperature inversion occurring. New low volatile formulations of 2,4-D and dicamba herbicides will be the only herbicides approved for use with the new herbicide tolerant soybean traits. Spraying these low volatile formulations of synthetic auxin herbicides will be essential in minimizing the occurrence of herbicide volatilization. Research conducted by scientists at the University of Georgia compared three formulations of 2,4-D and found that the newest formulation, 2,4-D-choline, in the product and list duo 
resulted in less than 1% herbicide injury due to volatilization of sensitive crops when compared to other 2,4-D formulations. However, even low volatile formulations can volatilize and it is essential for applicators to recognize conditions that favor herbicide volatilization. We have a good illustration of what can happen with tank contamination. So in this 30-foot swath of soybeans, we have a, a, an illustration of what could occur. And that is, we made an application with a tractor sprayer of dicamba in this case. Sprayer back to our mixing area, uh, emptied it out, and washed one time with water. Um, this is certainly not what we recommend doing, but it's to illustrate the significance of not uh, following our rinse procedures like we would like for farmers to do in the future. So we, so we rinsed out only once with water and we came back out and made another application right over these soybeans just like a farmer might do to go to another field and spray another herbicide for weed control. And so what happened here as you can see is tank contamination. We did not completely flush out the chemical from the sprayer and as a result we have significantly injured soybeans. Here you can see some soybeans that are very healthy. They're not cupped at all. There's no injury to these upper trifoliates as what you see here. And that is the second scenario where we rinsed out with ammonia all according to how we would recommend here at the University of Missouri. And so we triple rinsed. We had an ammonia rinse in there. And as you can see, uh, no problem in that second scenario there where we did everything as we might recommend. So I think the take home message is, as these technologies come on in the future, we must, uh, must be more careful with our rinsing and understanding how little of these herbicides can injure soybeans that are not uh, tolerant as, as we move forward. Pesticides can settle to the bottom or cause rapid corrosion in the spraying system and should be washed from the whole system immediately after use. When cleaning a sprayer, select a location where any spilled rinsate will not contaminate water supplies, streams, crops, or other plants, and where puddles will not be accessible to children, pets, livestock, or wildlife. Pay particular attention to sensitive vegetation that is in the runoff area. The best method for rinsate disposal is in the field in a manner consistent with the product's label. The easiest way to do this is to have rinse water available in the field, either on the sprayer or support vehicle. If 2,4-D or dicamba containing products like Enlist Duo or Roundup Extend have been applied and you intend to spray a sensitive crop subsequent to the application, then a triple rinse clean out will be necessary. First, thoroughly hose down the inside and outside surfaces of equipment while draining the sprayer tank, pump, screens, and lines with water for a minimum of five minutes. Second, fill the tank with clean water to at least 10% of the total tank volume and add either a commercial tank cleaner at the labeled rate or household ammonia at a rate of one gallon per 100 gallons of water. Circulate the cleaning solution through the entire sprayer system for at least 15 minutes and discharge some of the solution through the boom and nozzle. When possible, let the solution stand for several hours or even overnight. Drain the tank and remove all nozzles, screen, strainers, and boom caps and clean them separately in a bucket of cleaning agent and water. The final step is to put all nozzles, screens, and other components back together, then rinse the entire system with clean water until all rinse water is removed from the system. A new program called Flag to Technology is now being promoted by the University of Missouri's Weed Science Program and the Missouri Department of Agriculture. It is currently in practice in several southern states. Flag to Technology is a simple practice of inserting a bicycle flag at the entrance of your field throughout the season. And the color of that flag corresponds to a specific herbicide resistance trait. For example, a black and white checkered flag corresponds to extend varieties that are resistant to dicamba and glyphosate. A teal colored flag corresponds to the enlist trait which confers tolerance to 2,4-D and glyphosate. In contrast, a red flag means that a crop is conventional or not resistant to any kind of herbicide. 
you can ensure that misapplications do not occur to your crop and also make other surrounding farmers aware of the type of trait in your field. This simple program could keep a lot of potential mistakes from happening. Another useful program is called Drift Watch, which is a component of the Field Watch program. Field Watch is an online tool that enables applicators to see the location of sensitive crops such as grapes, berries, and melons. Specialty crop producers can register their field's GPS coordinates through the website. Once the Missouri Department of Agriculture confirms these entries, the specialty crop fields become marked on the website's interactive map, which pesticide applicators can view. However, not all sensitive crops have been registered on FieldWatch, so applicator awareness of the surroundings is still essential when spraying these herbicides. The availability of soybeans with tolerance to the synthetic auxin herbicides 2,4-D and dicambo will provide growers with more options to manage herbicide-resistant weeds. However, synthetic auxin herbicides are prone to move off target and must be managed accordingly or major problems can occur. Farmers and applicators must be aware of volatility and diligent to avoid physical drift and tank contamination. Practice the techniques discussed in this video to minimize and prevent damage to your field and your neighbors or to other sensitive species. Thanks for watching.